Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm John Copans. I am our facilitator for this evening. Uh, I'm also a Montpelier resident. Live up on Cliff Street, so like about a half a block that way, two blocks maybe. Uh, I got a neighbor from Cliff Street, Mr. 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 Anderson. You guys are all hot. We feel lucky to be on Cliff Street, yeah. given what town has been through. Um, I currently work uh, at a bike shop in Burlington, Old Spokes Home, a nonprofit bike shop. But before that, I spent five years working for the Vermont Council on Rural Development with Paul Costello. I, I ran the climate, uh, the climate economy programs there. So I think that explains why Paul asked me to be a facilitator. Not so much my bike shop experience and more <laughs> my VCRD experience. Uh, I think Paul teed up pretty well what this evening is about. It's actually, we have, a, this is a challenging session, I feel like. And, and, and here's why I think it's going to be challenging is because we, uh, we have someone taking notes for us, but we, what we don't have is like big pads with those notes being visible to everybody. And like the goal in this session, it, it's, it's broken up into blocks. We're going to spend 15 minutes talking about just sort of the lay of the land around city infrastructure. What's going on in Montpelier currently? Then the bulk of our time, 40 minutes, is going to be spent brainstorming ideas for what we think we should do as a city around city infrastructure. And then the last 15 or 20 minutes is going to be spent actually doing some prioritization. And that's, if I'm apprehensive about a part of our, our schedule tonight, it's that <laughs> last section, right? Normally what VCRD loves to do is have ideas on a wall and you all have stickers and we go stick those stickers and that's how we come to prioritization. So what we're gonna have to do instead is well, partially we're gonna have to go with the flow a little bit. My expectation is we're gonna ask our scribe to sort of review with us what the ideas are at that juncture where it's time to make prioritization. And then we're just gonna have to sort of, as a group, maybe we'll do a show of hands as we go through that list to try to narrow it down to two or three things that the group feels like are the priorities that we want to bring forward. Uh, it is important to note, though, that um, everything that we talk about tonight will be reflected in the notes, and those notes will be reviewed by the steering committee. Uh, and in fact, if something you say isn't prioritized tonight, but is a common theme that comes up in other sessions, the, the steering committee may well pluck that thing and that idea may come back before the group on, on, on September 7th when we get back together. So like, just know that even if whatever idea you bring to the table tonight doesn't necessarily come to a consensus decision by the group as a priority, there's other ways for things to enter into the process uh, before the train leaves the station in, um, at the next meeting, I would say. So, um, we have a couple of resource team members here, and I think it's only two, unless I'm missing somebody. If there's a third after I introduce the two, please, um, please recognize yourself. But, uh, Eric Law, I'm going to let you introduce yourself sure. and then Ben after that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So Eric Law, Community Programs Director, formally. I just left my position last Friday, so I think I'm freer to discuss, John. <laughs> uh, going to private consulting down in D.C., but I'll try to give the lens of, of you know, federal, state, uh, municipal sources of funds in this day and age for my period. So formally at USDA Rural Development, Yes, right? important yeah, to, yeah, I'm going to put yeah. that as the first note. <laughs> And uh, Ben Montross. Yep. Ben Montross. Um, so I am a city resident, and I work for the Agency of Natural Resources. I oversee the public drinking water program. So we regulate the Montpelier drinking water system among 1,360 other public drinking water systems in the state. Thanks. 
Is there anybody else who's a, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. Hey, Hi, I'm Haley Perro. I'm a Senator Sanders Outreach Director. I work mostly on environmental, energy, and some FEMA issues. Uh, so hopefully I can be helpful, but mostly here to listen and take what I learned back to the office. Thank you. Are there any engineers here? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> this is a very engineering problem. Yeah. I'm, yay. <laughs> oh, thank you. We got some hands. Um, so I think before we get started, I might ask, is there a volunteer who wants to read the description of, you know, there's these little blurbs. I don't know if some of you probably have it, but there's a little description for city infrastructure in your packet. Anybody want to just read that aloud? It might help us have a common sense of what we're talking about tonight. Any, any volunteer willing to do that? I'll read it, but I lost my sheet. Oh, here you go. Oh. Yeah. Trying to top of the page. Yeah. Um, city infrastructure. What changes are needed in Montpelier's water, sewer, and stormwater, roads and bridges, buildings, dams, and embankment infrastructure to better protect the city from future flooding events? Are there other infrastructure opportunities in expanded district heating, dry storage for downtown businesses, or other projects that could reduce future damage to public and private property? Uh, before we start, like, how do folks feel like that tees things up? Does that feel like it captures? Yeah. Not yes, and one missing thing, which is care and feeding the existing infrastructure and assessment of how healthy it is, and let's fix it. Uh -huh. So I not know, just sort of forward-looking, not just new, but existing. That part of the project could be let's look at what we've got and fix it. Uh -huh. So inventory and asset management. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Great. Other things in that description that you, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, yes, my name's Scott Muller. Uh, I've been working in urban infrastructure for 35 years. Some of the biggest cities in the world. Um, senior advisor with the UN, World Bank, lots of, so all day urban infrastructure for me. Um, these transformative challenges are not new. It's happening everywhere. Um, I can tell you that one of the biggest success attributes is to not limit the discussion of infrastructure to hard infrastructure. Soft infrastructure is a really important part of that transition. Most of our governance systems were set up for ecosystems and metabolism that was much different, much different financial situations, management, accounting, transparency, accountability. All those issues uh, should be looked at when you're talking about this rapid shift in infrastructure. So to talk about governance as soft infrastructure, to talk about the relationship between the state and the city and the accountability and the financial flows, all that is soft infrastructure. So I would caution against leaving that out of a intimate conversation with hard infrastructure. That's a helpful, I feel like, maybe framing and, and expansion probably of what we're talking about here. Thank you. Yeah. It may not be official resource people. I just want to recognize our superintendent and high school principal are both here. And Aww. they're fabulous. And they have been taking care of some of our really important infrastructure already. And probably the schools will come into this conversation. Thank you. It's nice to have you both here. Good to be here. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so maybe we should get after it at this point. So what's the lay of the land in terms of Montpelier infrastructure? And I will say, uh, for resource people, it's definitely, um, feel free to contribute. Uh, you know that, that's why you're here. But uh, particularly in this, like, what is the current lay of the land? If you have familiarity with, what, with what's going on, that's not to limit other people's contribution, but feel free uh, to weigh in there. So what's, what's the state of affairs uh, for Montpelier's infrastructure at this point? Well, I'm not sure about anybody else, but I, I live in a, in a part of Montpelier that had five feet of water in my basement downtown. And I know that the water, it was a, it was a overwhelming of the stormwater system. It was all stormwater that came up into our basements on St. Paul Street. And I know that the water needs someplace else to go. So I know it's a much bigger issue than just like piping it somewhere else. But um, I think that's part of the issue that certainly I'm concerned about here is that what's the future look like for people who live in these downtown areas and the businesses, of course. What kind of guarantee or assurance can we get to? Particularly We're around the storm, the storm water system yeah, and the infiltration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, you and then come. Yeah. I'll add to that in that you were lucky 
because many people not only had stormwater but had sewage yeah. in the basement yeah. that went to the in the stormwater. Yeah, right. praise God. It's right. So it's both stormwater and the sewer system had uh, just too much. Couldn't couldn't handle the flow. Uh, Colin, and then you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the Winooski from the confluence of the North Branch downstream is obviously inadequate to handle the volume of rain coming in. That's not the normal river channel that it was. That was channelized by the CCC back in the 30s. Um, so we know that during that storm, this recent storm, we had 21,000 cubic feet per second coming in the main branch of the Winooski, 1,200 cubic feet per second coming in the north branch. We need at least that much capacity to get the water out of town from that confluence south. And we're blessed in Vermont to have elevation change and gravity that we can harness to get that water out of here. If we give the, if we have a river channel that's great, that can handle greater than 22,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, I just have a, a simple question, I guess. When, what is the expectation that this is the right place for it? You know, for for sewer systems in, in cities, um, is it reasonable to think they wouldn't back up into houses? They're, they're not closed systems. I don't know. Do other cities deal with this in some way that they can not have that back up into houses? That seems ideal. I'm curious, kind of what what the options there are. Is that a reasonable goal? Yeah, it's sort of a technical question, and yeah, it seems it seems reasonable, right? Well, and I know I know that uh, there's some separation, yeah. ideally, of sewer and stormwater, sure. right? And Maybe Scott can. I'd like to make a suggestion, suggestion that this group just adopt an informal Chatham House rule, which means people can say anything, and you're free to talk about what's talked about in the room, but not who said it. Because there are a lot of officials here, and there are a lot of people whose work this is that don't want to talk about the problems in their system. And I think if you can somehow establish you know, an agreement of the participants that you're free to talk about what people discuss in here, but not who said it. Well, and in fact, no takers no, don't. Yeah, we don't attribute anything. Great. So I'm glad you said that. That is that is practice here, for sure. Yeah. Just one quick comment uh, in reference to yours. You know, uh, CSO, right, combined sewer overflow. Sure. Um, the city of Montpelier has, has been for decades trying to separate um, storm from sewer, and but not all the way there, right? And most of our towns, I think it's, it's safe to say, are still dealing with CSOs. But certainly our larger towns, Rhode Island, Burlington, and Montpelier is no different. Um, so it certainly didn't help. Um, so you've been doing it for a long time, but there's been no solution? Yeah, I'm not the city of Montpelier. No, 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 but but, but uh, yeah, I think, the, I think the city has been, CSO is a huge problem. Um, you know, in my former role at Rural Development, we funded a lot of uh, uh, CSO combined with wastewater treatment upgrades. Uh, but certainly there's more to do. So, so it means um, it's not all separated yet. But every project is being worked on. Correct. Yep. Yeah, it's one of those where you, you resolve one point and there's other points and other like points. And and okay. It's yep. a big, big project with lots we of We have little, six little CSO pieces. overflow structures currently in Montpelier. Six, six, six CSO overflow structures. I mean, six locations where when things get overwhelmed, they can overflow and go to the river. Um, and that's down from in the 90s, I think it was like 46 or 50 yeah, 40 that we something. used to have. And so we need a lot more? No, so no I think we need to have six. We Ideally, we have zero, zero structures oh, okay. that overflow to the river. Okay. Right. And so right now, the two big projects that we're doing is the State Street project that you see out here, which is removing about an acre and a half of impervious area that's directly connected to our sewer system. And then the other project is the East State Street project where we're disconnecting another probably acre or half acre of impervious that's directly tied to our sewer system. Those and two projects. Have you been doing that before the flood? Oh, yeah. Yes, we've been right. working so on this consistently for the yeah. last uh, 20 to 30 years. Okay. Oh, and don't feel like you have to, but you want to introduce yourself since yeah. you Yeah, <laughs> I'm Deputy Director for City of Montpelier of the Public Works Department, and my name is Zach Blodgett. Great. Thanks, Zach. Yeah. Other things in terms of uh, Montpelier's infrastructure. Yeah, go for it. Um, so others have mentioned uh, some of the challenges uh, with the flood water containing sewage. Another pollutant was, of course, oil. Um, and that got me interested in talking more about a resource that we already have uh, in the community, which is the district heat system. 
um, both because uh, those institutions attached to the district heat system and making use of that uh, may have had less oil that was spilling into the system, but also it was a way to reduce reliance on oil. It's been a challenging project. Um, I think it's significantly underutilized, but the great thing is it's there. It's working. It has significantly more capacity than the community is using, and I would love to explore more opportunities. Um, of course, now we have for, uh, the Vermont um, College of Fine Arts up on the green, up on the hill, um, having sold some of its properties to Greenway Institute, which is looking at renewing some of the buildings um, and the idea of potentially bringing, for example, the district heat system up the hill, uh, both for institutional access and I would say more importantly, residential access. But that needs to come with incentives. Um, the upfront costs are huge, both to organizations, businesses, um, and residents, but I think the benefits are potentially significant. And it's right there. It's like right there, making heat. <laughs> so. Great. And just to like clarify for folks that what I heard there was both current state of affairs, we have an existing, dis existing district heating system, and I think an idea for the future as well, which was let's take advantage and expand the, the sort of reach of that right. district. Well, to the elementary school and to others, aren't there possibilities right now? Unfortunately, time is really tight before days get cold, uh, but to incentivize, um, instead of rapidly replacing oil furnaces, which is probably the most logical and immediate solution, but wouldn't it be ideal if there were ways to tap into that system? Because to my knowledge, um, yeah, it's significantly underutilized. Yeah, can I ask, because we're, we're hitting asset classes, I was waiting for the first asset class of district heat. What is the state of district heat now after the storm? Was there any damage to our district heating system? As, Ooh, does, far any, as we know? does anyone know that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Individually, the, the core system is okay, Correct. but because we took mitigation steps when it was built. But along the way, you have all these pump stations that got flooded at gotcha. individual sites. And are those pump stations associated with buildings that are being served, or is it? Buildings being served. It's the meter, like most places lost their meters that okay. run the district heat systems. They okay. lost all of their uh, like internal piping components. So all of what happened at the building. At, at the individual yes. you know, connections. Yeah. Connections. In the basements? Yes. yes. Wait, sorry, we didn't just, for my sake of resiliency, they were damaged and need to be replaced and aren't operable right now? Uh, so I'm not the district heat expert by sure. any way, shape, or form. I just know that right now a majority of our users have issues with their meters and that they're looking to get those replaced and that the city is working to get that stood up before this winter season. The city is in charge of replacing the uh, meters that sure yeah. allow for the billing and the users are forced to essentially just change the circulation pumps, which is something you would have on a regular boiler. Exactly. So, you don't have to replace the boiler, but you have to re replace all of your circulation. Are, are people looking at replacing them up higher? Not, I mean, uh, not in the basements? I work for three buildings downtown, one of which is a Kellogg covered library. We won't be replacing, moving them because you can flood 600 times before it would like behoove me to like pay for the piping and moving it up above, but the controls will be moved up. Yeah, okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, but maybe that's something to put on our list of even though the building itself in the heating system was improved when we made it or was they thought of flooding, the system isn't. So the system's not working. That's one of the major problems with the state buildings. So we need to look at what could we do to make sure that the things that you've spoken of that aren't working are up higher or something because <coughs> those pipes are underground. Well, and there's different categories of stuff, right? What I just heard is there's controls that they're moving up, which I think is much more expensive to replace versus maybe some piping and circulator pumps, which apparently, But yeah. if any of that stuff is done in by the ordinary flood. How do we make it more resilient? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I see a hand here. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, I'm Zach Ford, I'm the president of Caramon Gillier, and I really appreciate the comments of my neighbor here talking about our rivers. and. Um, I, I hate to be a contrarian viewpoint here potentially, but um, I'm not wild about our district heating system. Mm -hmm. And I am not particularly interested in expanding it. Um, it was placed in an awful location. 
uh, and is exactly the kind of development that I hope we avoid going forward when we want to look at flushing that water downstream, letting it go out onto a, its historic floodplain. Um, that heating system, you know, in, in the, all those parking lots, you know, there, I hope that as a part of this city infrastructure conversation, it's kind of embedded in the description, but not as explicit as I wish it was. I, I wish we would also, in this discussion, talk about, or I hope we will talk about, uh, the ways that we can multi-solve by um, restoring our floodplains, beautifying our city, making Montpelier face the river for the first time and take advantage of this amazing location of the confluence of two beautiful rivers that typically you can't even see walking around town. Um, and all the things that that would do for our economy, not to mention for you know uh, public health and well-being, uh, you know, on down the list. So I guess just to put in the plug for um, really rethinking our connection to the rivers, and then and then from there zooming out and, and, and seeing how that can benefit so many other aspects of our of our town. A lot more to say there, but all right. And and let's just um, I think uh, let's work on not like. We're going to have 15 minutes at the end to do some prioritization. And I think it's appropriate at that point to have a little bit of a debate about ideas that are on the table. I'd ask folks to restrain from that response to specific ideas at this phase and things, if that's OK with folks. Um, and I think we probably should shift. I see another hand, but I think we should start to move more towards just free-flowing ideas about what should we be doing around city infrastructure, because we've got, uh, I've got to keep time here, and we've got to keep moving. So uh, I see three hands, one there, yeah, Colin, and then, yeah. Um, and so a, a really key piece of infrastructure is the Riceville Dam. Not in Montpelier, but it's created for Montpelier. Um, and it's performed very well over the 100 years. Well, not quite 100. Um, but there can be improvements made to its holding capacity, increasing its discharge rate at a safe time so it can recharge for the next rain event. We got lucky in this last one that a really big rain event went south of us while the dam was full. Um, so I think we can figure out ways to drain the dam quicker to be able to handle more rain events just one after the other. So there's an idea, change sort of the operating standard for Riceville to maximize its sort of flood. There's some infrastructure control. there and you're, in a hydro plant. Aha, yeah. uh -huh, as well. So it's not just operating, it's also some infrastructure. The way you're presenting it's like the ultimate piece of infrastructure, almost. Uh, <laughs> the way I think, yeah, okay. Yeah. To, be, to be debated, but yeah. Yeah, hand, uh, Scott, I think you said your name was. Uh, please, thank you. Yeah. Uh, transportation. So at the mouth of uh, the North Branch, where the Shell Station is, if you look at that from above, that's all fill. And it looks kind of ridiculous. And it's where the river pounds into, and it starts backing up the Winooski there when it comes out. It brings up the conversation of the strode, right? The tension all along the street there of the street and the road and the speedometer and the commercial versus the residential coming into town. So if you're talking about that river going back to its natural course and being able to handle higher volumes of water, you have to have a conversation about where to get off the interstate and come into Montpelier. Um, this is all blue sky ideas, so I'm not holding back, but, uh, but it looks ridiculous as a planner from above putting gas stations right at the mouth of the river there. It's absurd. <laughs> so John, we're getting, some, we're getting some good asset classes now, like District Heat, the Brightsville Dam, Transportation Carters. Maybe uh, you want to hit up on schools? A little bit. Yeah. Right, so is there, yeah. Is there a hand over there? Or? Not my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I was raising your hand for <laughs> All right. Well, we'll keep think, about it, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Yeah. Can you say on being with roadways, I don't have technical knowledge, but I know that more permeable roadways can be beneficial in increasing drainage and so forth. I also know that maintaining typical asphalt roads in Vermont is basically a disaster. Um, as we all know, it's a real challenge. Is there any universe in which alternative road surfaces that are more permeable, uh, maybe more open to change? I mean, I don't know, we could just have mud in town and, mud, and really celebrate mud season, like go for it. Um, it could be a unique attraction. Uh, maybe, maybe not that, that's hyperbole. But I, I do wonder if there's a scenario where we can tackle both the really challenging conditions of our roadways and at the same time 
promote drainage and allow for water to more naturally be absorbed into the soil. Under much of that pavement right. are cobblestones, which obviously in between the cobblestones are from people. Right, yeah. which you know, it, it's right. an interesting aside that you know that some roads in Vermont going up to like the old Air Force Base in the Northeast Kingdom that don't get um, plowed, they're in perfect condition, and that road is 60 to 70 years old, mm -hmm. and it is impeccable. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at how do we maintain our roads more than how they're built as well. Yeah, go ahead. Just a quick um, piggyback on Jack's uh, comment, and I think my, one of my big takeaways from our first meeting that we had was that we really need to be thinking of a regional watershed here, and not just like the mm -hmm. North Branch and the Winooski, but what's, what's the big picture in our big central Vermont area that we need to be looking at. So think regionally yeah. as a watershed. Got it. I yeah. have two ideas I just want to throw out. One, for the waterways when it's coming down from the hills and the mountains, besides the rivers, we had everything was so saturated that nothing, there was nowhere for it to go besides the rivers. But um, somebody told me about it, an idea of making uh, like craters, small craters in the hills that are empty, but when the water starts flowing and there's too much water, they fill. So it slows it, mm -hmm. not the rivers, that that's a different issue. And then a completely different idea I have, which I don't know if it's the right place to bring up, but um, I think we should look at maybe doing like a high line like they have in New York City on State and Maine. And um, it would bring a lot of people here. People, you know, and then underneath have pop-ups or parking or water <laughs> running, the rivers running through it that we can look at and um, make the town more beautiful and have the river, yeah. So elevate at, at the downtown level, somehow bring, yes. bring it up. And people and have talked space. about you know, yeah. filling it up and having the second floors be the, first, the level, but I think a high line idea would work. <coughs> the high line is um, in Manhattan on the railroad bed, they turned it into a walkway, a greenway. So it's, and then all these stores have, and restaurants have popped up around it. It's it was quite an old raised, I think, railroad, raised railroad. Uh, that they just transformed into sort of a walkable, uh, usable public space. Did they raise everything else so to make the stores? No, 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 that's no. what's interesting <laughs> about the High Line is you're yeah. sort of like. Uh, you're up yeah. there, but the stores are still vulnerable. Well, yeah. I would say that we would do it different way, you know, so that this underneath. Yeah, we won't take it too literally, I think. Yeah. The idea generally is to sort of elevate and then use the space down below Different. differently. Yeah. Is that fair yes. to? Okay, yes. great. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just I think building on sort of the same ideas on the, the plan and the, the analogy of the highway and where you got the highway, I think 84% of downtown Montpelier is parking lots including right up to the waterway on both sides. Uh, I think the gas station on one side and the parking lot right on the other, right? Um, there's a, an immense amount of land we've capped and made it so water can't go into that land right in the floodway. Um, that water could be there, housing could be there, uh, green space could be there. There's a lot of opportunities in that space that currently is being used for cars. Um, well, it used to be used for cars. And recently, it's not used for much anymore, but uh, it's a huge opportunity. Great. Zach, and then Cara. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah. And um, I wanted to just check in with our note, note taker for a second, because I, I wanted to, I don't, was wondering if you might define asset class, because I don't know if, if when I heard you repeat back a second ago, some of the categories yep. that we're talking about, whether it covers everything that I'm hearing. Yep. So I just was curious. Well, no, so I'm hearing, I'm pulling from the crowd, right? So state of the state, what's the state of our infrastructure? Yeah, yeah. So the way I think of it is like schools, city infrastructure, state's infrastructure, right? Our water, wastewater systems, our district heat, that's where I was pulling from. Okay. So, so when, I, when he says state of the state, I'm pulling from like, what's the, what's the hard infrastructure? And also what's the soft infrastructure that we don't have or want to have? Okay, that's great. So it sounds like, I'm, I mean, I'm hearing a lot about pavement. So I'm hoping that you know somewhere in that infrastructure, you know, there's something for impervious services, you know, of various kinds. Um, and I wanted to just piggyback on the comment a second ago that 
this, this, this sunken lot next to Court Street right here is a fantastic location for an elevated plaza of some you know, wonderful variety with you know, shops and a brewery and you know, gosh, so many things you could do with, with Montpelier. Um, and I, you know, I think I, you know, the, the best solution to me to make our city more resilient is to get things out of harm's way. You know? So it's not just, I, I, you know, the more that we can think about, um, you know, right, natural disasters are natural to some degree, considering not, climate change notwithstanding, what makes them disasters is putting people and our things in the way. And so, you know, as I'm thinking about the high school, um, you know, my daughter will be there in, I don't know, some number of years. Um, I would imagine maybe she could go to the high school at the VCMA. You know, maybe that's where the high school could be located in the future. It seems like we're really looking for a great tenant in that space. Um, and, you know, turn our high school into a floodplain again, or playing fields, you know. Um, so just another, another possibility. Um, and just to maybe identify a theme here, sort of the relocation of various things in our community to allow for uh, the water to flow without inflicting some of the it's, damage. Is that? Seems like we just yeah. keep rebuilding, redoing. Uh, Cara had. Yeah, I just wanted to speak to the schools. There's already a conversation that's happening. It's happening very vociferously on Front Porch Forum. I don't have an opinion about what the solutions should be, but I think we need to have a really thoughtful and gentle conversation about that as the parent of a rising ninth grader who's nervous when she hears things. So I just think we need to be thoughtful about it and we need to have a conversation and maybe it could be somewhat student-led as the schools get started. I don't know if there's interest in that, but it feels like that's a long conversation. Mm -hmm. just, just building upon you know, BCFA, um, there is a city goal to start building out housing in the country club, which if, if irrespective of thoughts and opinions on that, if that project goes forward, you could conceivably see 300 homes that are potentially the most affordable in town. Uh, each of those houses has two children. All of a sudden, the center, you know, the center of where a child is a month later moves pretty quick. And I know some of the discussions on from page four were about busing um, and how difficult it would be to get them to different schools. Um, we might have 600 kids that can walk to, to U32. It's, it's, there's a path there. So. Yeah. There are multiple options there, and I think the future of housing is also, uh, especially affordable housing, is, is interesting to look at. And at this point, I feel like the idea is there around sort of, just like with other uh, assets, let's say, the school, what do we do about the school? So let's not sort of, I think, continue to debate it here, because it's an idea that we can talk about as we, as we wrap things up. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I've been through four flood events in this town, and uh, this one is, is different. Um, it really is. You know, I'm, I'm not advocating for parking lots. I don't like them at all. But our ground was at, absolutely saturated. And it didn't make any difference whether it was a permeable surface or an impermeable surface. The ground couldn't handle any more water when that rain event happened. So really, while the parking lots probably contributed some, it was minimal. It's not like Irene. It wasn't like this unbelievable rain event. I've, when I see that what happened, I just said, we have to go up. We have to go up one way or another. I don't care if it's Vermont Council of the Fine Arts Building or higher ground, or it's just the second story. But everybody has to no longer view basements as usable spaces in Montpelier. They aren't. They're, they're trash. They're places where water needs to come in and go out. And we need to build them so that we can hose them down. I don't know if people were downtown right after the flood, but I was there a lot. And the yellow uh, mustard, if you went by it on Wednesday, they hose that place down, tile floors, the room was clean. It was like, you need to be able to go in there with a fire hose and just let the water come in, it's gonna be dirty, and you gotta get it out. So we can't, have, we can't have anything of value down low. That should be apparent to everybody, and you know, there are a lot of really responsible landlords who are already moving everything up. I mean, they've been through it three times. 
Um, I, I just talked to Steve Everett. So everything of value in his buildings is going to the second story. And we need to encourage everyone else, even though it is a big nut, it's a big ask. They got to do it. They have to do it. Otherwise, we're just throwing money down the drain. Uh, oh, just a hand in the back and then, yeah. Um, while we're putting all these things in place, I just heard somebody say that for the last 20 years, we've been working on separating sewer from uh, water runoff. I'd like us quickly to solve that problem while we're waiting for other things to happen. So, all right, that's a clear idea. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm really interested in the whole soft infrastructure question because I don't see any of these good ideas getting implemented without an effective governance and implementation system. And I would, I, I don't have an idea. I don't know enough about what's possible. It's also easy to decide engineering things in some ways, but this is if maybe we could have a. a careful study of Montpelier's governance system, the whole mayor city, <coughs> city manager thing. What is working? What doesn't work? What works in other places? We have some expertise in the town. But it seems to me that that's a, oddly a foundation under everything. <coughs> Paul? Um, another idea is uh, buyouts for uh, properties that are in the floodplain. Um, when the city should uh, pursue that. Um, I don't know what sort of money is available from the state or the feds, um, but I know that um, Northfield did that very successfully. Um, I know that our um, mayor has already gone on record being opposed to it. Uh, I think we shouldn't take things off the table um, and we should explore to see what, um, what sort of options and whether, it, whether it's a possibility for us to vote. I heard there's that there a new hand here hundred. that I want to be sure to bring a new voice in. Yeah, uh, for two things that I thought I would hear about. One, one's actually a question, but we still have a high water pressure problem, uh, mm -hmm. despite the fact that DPW and the city and the state have kind of agreed on a solution. The solution is a, an extended solution. We won't know really if it works for a couple of decades. Uh, the other thing is I don't know how close we came to losing the water the wastewater treatment plant. Does anybody know? I mean, the water was pretty close to the top of the road. What happens when the water, water goes over the road? Do, yeah, we, we, do we need to get into, beef up that plant somehow? Um, there's some slight conversations right now about whether or not we should raise that river road up mm -hmm. a couple of additional feet so in order to make a, a bigger dam so that yeah. you have more protection. Um, so the, the road itself? Yes. Right. If you build, because right now the water sure. came up to about the very top of the road shoulder, but never crested over and never made it. But that's what protected the Yes, essentially. and same with the, the public works garage. Like I mean, we're like very it. close to having water in both of those buildings as well. In the town of Johnson, their wastewater plant was overwhelmed and everything's just going into the Lemoyne River. So it's well, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's why that's, what, that's where it goes. Just yeah. to continue, I mean, Sally Ray Ray points around the water infrastructure. Um, while we wait for the next flood to happen, water keeps on pumping down the hill at, at high pressure. I believe the state has opinions on um, 200 PSI water in the downtown. I think something like 20% of our, our water lines are past their, their service age. We have more water breaks than Burlington does. Um, those are things that aren't, aren't new and fun, um, but are going to impact any of these projects that we talk about at BCFA or at downtown businesses. Um, that, that needs to be, it was being looked at, I think the flood distracted us, that needs to be back on the radar that those investments need to happen. There's a, a $90 million investment that needs to happen over the next 50 years that is looming. And I guess I hear in that a current state of affairs and an idea which is to robustly address. We need robust water infrastructure. Uh -huh. The fix to the, the high pressure situation. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Johnson, uh, resident of the town, also a civil engineer. Um, I just wanted to mention flood storage, with it, which I think was kind of mentioned, but wanted to ensure, just from the infrastructure perspective, I think um, 
you know, I was mentioned to look at a regional approach, right, as far as um, the watershed. Uh, I think that's also an infrastructure discussion. I don't know, maybe studies have been done since the 30s to see where more flood storage can be gained, but it seems that would be an important component. So flood storage would be another dam? Potentially. Is that what you More dams, more, you know, perhaps it's raising dams, perhaps it's, you know, there was the talk about, um, you know, trying to make some operational adjustments to Wrightsville. Uh, that's kind of along the same idea. Um, Great. John? Along the same line, I'm John Armstrong, an engineer also. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning about the uh, cubic feet per minute per and second. that the two rivers are greater than the exit. Right. Uh, so are you saying that if the uh, River was channeled below Montpelier. It was de-channeled to return it back to its original corridor with greater capacity. If it was expanded so it would hold more water, right. that so would eliminate what happened in that flood, in Montpelier. Right. So you know the the Winooski proper was full of capacity, and then the 1,200 cubic feet per second coming in from the North Branch yeah. backed up. You know, so if we have a release valve, it's just, well, it's not a valve, it's just built right in. <laughs> you know, we get the hydrologists, hydrologists in here, determine what the greatest probable flood, um, you know, cubic feet per second coming in the winter ski would be, add that to the residual and the north branch, and then add a margin for error with climate change, and make the corridor exiting Montpelier adequate to discharge Whatever it is, 30,000 cubic wow, feet per second. That would be a, a giant help. You know, use the, reclaim those parking lots, the school ball fields, and get it out of town. Uh, yeah. Um, I had a business in, my, in Montpelier that got flooded, but I live in Worcester, up 1,200 feet, and our road was completely destroyed, so it had nothing to do with the rivers. Mm -hmm. It had to do with the water running down. <laughs> And that's also, I mean, I you know, want to, don't want to get out of Montpelier, but that's also part of the issue is a lot of water. And um, it just destroyed so many roads and properties. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, so one is, I think it's really important that we build the structures so that when things like this happen, we can help people move to the next better thing rather than replace what they already had. I, mm -hmm. I think that's been said before, but getting the oil tanks out, getting better systems in, um, in terms of heating the buildings, and we have to be ready for that because even with this happening in early July, we're not ready to do that for the heating season. So if this is gonna happen again, we need to be ready to get people set up with better systems right afterwards. My second completely different uh, thought was in relation to what you were saying about the basement. It does seem like we shouldn't be putting things down in the basements. I've heard two opposing solutions. One is let the water in, make it so we can clean up really well afterwards, and the other is fill the basements. And I'd love to have some engineering expertise on which of those is actually a good idea or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, and maybe in that is an idea, which is like, that's a, that's a question facing many homeowners and building owners in town. Like, what is the process by which we collectively learn and then share that learning and then provide the resources to sort of implement whatever it is that the learning brings? Is that yes. sort of? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, go for it. So we, we, have, we have a challenge here, and it's different than the challenge in Barry. So Barry is fast water. And you know, buildings get hugely damaged. But here, it's like a bathtub. We just fill up. So I don't, I'm not an engineer and I don't know, but I think that we can let it come in and let it go out. That's just my sense. But something just happened where we, we have a, an investment in our wastewater recovery facility that everyone needs to understand how dynamic and astronomical it is. It's our biggest asset. And I didn't realize how close it came. So that needs to be our number one priority, is protecting the wastewater recovery facility. If it's a berm, if it's raising the road, it needs to be protected more than 
I was just told it. <laughs> if it came that close, that's a, that's a $50 million investment. Uh, there's no bigger investment in this city. So we need to think about that, how to protect that. Just, sorry, just a question now. Like, would that facility flooding cause $50 million of damage? Uh, that's a little hard to, to say. Um, I mean, it would be pretty catastrophic if water It'd be terrible. Into that. It'd be terrible. And then do you. I mean, pollution, pollution's bad, really bad, right? Not having the facility is even worse. And are, are there facilities to raise things up as well as to put berms in? Like what? Or is it just stuff in the ground that can't be moved? I mean, the, how the system works, it's the lowest point in the city. That's how the sewage gets from, you know, all over town to its final destination. So the piping is very, the, all of that stuff is set. So the only thing you can do really is to protect it more. Uh, at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, two points. I'm really surprised that nobody has brought up um, a few years ago, Dan Jones, 501c3, about re-envisioning downtown, where an architectural prize was given. Some of the most prestigious firms in the world redesigned downtown Montpelier for free to convert those parking lots into public space. Thousands of people participated in that process. A huge amount of enthusiasm was generated, and then pff, nothing. And it's all those designs should be revisited yeah. because it is a very forward-thinking, cost-effective way to rebuild downtown into public space and improving water. Um, the second quick point is uh, more, t more towards uh, helping steer the direction towards a self-governance conversation. <clears throat> Why didn't those plans go forward? You know, wh what happened to that? There was no receiving, sort of put that into, into um, two hands in the ground. Um, it shows up in schooling, it shows up in the right to housing, it shows up in a lot of uh, aspects of Montpelier that you're feeling. Um, the commercialization, the financialization of real estate in Vermont has sort of run havoc in a lot of cities, uh, unchecked. Uh, from the point of gerrymandering a TIF district across 22, 23 cities in Vermont that wouldn't pass a freshman level college city planning. Um, to in the last six, seven years in Montpelier, the housing stock effectively hasn't changed. Only a very, very small percentage, it hasn't changed. But the ratio of renters to owners has changed by 30%. So there's many more second and third home owners in Montpelier. There's no uh, institution that's addressing that so that school teachers can afford to live in the city where they work, right? That ratio in Montpelier is um, obscene. Um, the same with public employees, right? They can't afford to live in the city where they work. You're saying there's more private homes that are owned? Second more, more people Second owned. Second homes. So Second renters, homes. there's more renters. Of the, of the constant population of Montpelier, it's shifted to renters by about 25% in just the last five, six years. Oh, and that trend is active. It's not over. We're up to like 55% now, no? Almost, yeah, a little more. Different yep. renters. Yep. Um, yeah, there's ways to control that that other cities are actively involved with. So what you're describing, just to try to encapsulate that you. into an idea, is this is in that soft infrastructure category of sort of having stronger policies uh, that would address those sorts of trends, let's say. Uh, like, I just want to try that. It's a lot of conversation, but yeah. when social norms get regularized, they become institutionalized, and these things become institutions. We don't have institutions yet around this issue of housing, around this issue of uh, transparency and accountability, of ethics and governance, right? A lot of these mistakes we're pointing out, we've been working on these infrastructures for 20, 30 years, or a million dollars in legal debt for this failed thing, or and on and on. Um, you know, so what's that? Here's the thing is something, sure. this will come back to the group in a couple of weeks as an action item. How might we, what is the action item f that is sort of within our control in Montpelier to sort of address what you're describing? Like what is that, what's that look like? Well, it's a sub-process of this, but it gets into good governance, uh, which has its set of metrics, um, which can be looked at very clearly. Um, it's another conversation, uh, but it affects everything from transportation to schools to redesigning downtown, buying out homes. Um, mm -hmm. 
So sort of a re-envisioning and a restructuring of governance in uh, the issue is Vermont is a small population, and so the logic used to be that because these towns are small, they don't need strong mayor systems. They just need a council manager system. But if you look around Vermont and you look at some of the cities that have gone through rapid transformations, the waterfront in Burlington, the street in Barrie, um, and onwards, uh, you're looking at more of a system of weak mayor, strong mayor, uh, systems of accountability, systems of, um, of transparency that uh, are helpful to financing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. that, uh, just one question, that public envisioning process, I'm not from Vermont. The public envisioning process was circa 2020. It's pretty recent. I heard about it. Oh, somebody else, please. Longer at the time. Oh, no. Yeah, that was yeah. Uh, 2015. At least eight years ago. Net zero, Mon you could refer to it as net zero, zero Montpelier. Or net zero, like, okay. Yeah. Net zero, Montpelier. Right. Okay. So and then sure. it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, just to go a little bit on, on the, the same theme of things that have been done already and then sort of dropped. After Hurricane Irene in 2011, the State Department of Housing and Community Development commissioned a committee to come up with a, a, a plan to avoid what we just experienced. It's called the uh, Vermont Economic Resilience Initiative. The word flood doesn't appear in the title. Maybe that's why nobody's heard of it. But it's, you know, it's like 800 pages. And wow. just to give you an example of what's in there, there was confusion as soon as people started cleaning out their basements about Stacking, I mean, a simple thing, stacking the trash, you know, in, in categories so it could be picked up yeah. easily and faster. Guess what? It's in this report. A chart tells you exactly how to do it. That was seven years ago. What happened to that? I, I just chanced upon it. Wait, I'm sorry, the name of the report. I'm sorry, sir. The, the name of the report? Very. The Vermont uh -huh. Economic Resilience <laughs> Initiative, G E R I. Anyway, we need to, we need to realize that. This has been done before to a certain degree. We have a new, yeah. new circumstance, but we ought to look back at what's already been done. So I just want to second that. When I went to my business, when I was allowed in, we all were just throwing everything out. Nobody told us anything. And, you know, I would have to say, Montpere Alive was amazing, and all the volunteers were incredible but nobody was directed by anybody on how to do it mm -hmm. and to have protection. And people were mm -hmm. mucking this stuff with no gloves, no mask, and mm -hmm. nobody was telling us. Later, after we were all done, it was suggested that we sort it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And <laughs> uh, we so. are at 15 minutes to go. <laughs> and so it's time to coalesce. Just uh, one quick yeah. category to make sure we have uh, in the notes is that, and that is resource, finance, financing and resources for all these things they're saying, like, move your stuff upstairs. Well, who's going to pay for that? So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we need, to, we need to talk about financing all of these things. Mm -hmm. I just want to add a, a couple points of detail to what I already have uh, suggested. So to bolster the argument in favor of widening the river channel from the confluence out of town, 30 years ago we had an ice jam flood in town. So if we take care of that river channel exiting town, we're also reducing the chances of another ice jam flood. Um, you know, a lot of you probably weren't here 30 years ago, maybe you were, but um, you know, totally different scenario from this one. No rain, just a backup because it's a narrow, not natural river channel out of Montpelier. Um, and then to go over to Wrightsville Dam and flesh out quickly, um, that once the water level reaches 665 feet, they have to shut down all of their turbines in the hydro station because they're not, they're not, the turbines can't handle greater head pressure above that. So right when we really need to be able to get water out of the dam and we have the greater potential to generate green electricity, we shut it all down and we, we reduce the discharge rate by 20%. So if we have the ability through a public-private with the Washington Electric Co-op to invest in new turbines that can run right up to the full head of 685 feet and we can turn it off and on, shut it down as the rivers are 
flooding or potentially flooding, once the rivers have proceeded, turn them right back on and increase the discharge rate by 20%. So we're then recharging the retention capacity for that next rain event. If we got lucky this time, it didn't come. But in the All future... Right. Colin, I'm gonna just pause you there because I think that falls into that, that more general idea of like at Wrightsville, addressing the operations such that we're sort of maximizing its flood control potential. I just want to make it clear that I'm not suggesting building a new higher dam. It's just a turbine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we now need to uh, decide on some priorities as we get ready to go upstairs. And so um, I'm actually, I'm going to ask for Eric's help because Eric actually has some, <laughs> this is, I'm giving Eric an impossible task. But I think it's a team effort here that Eric and I, and frankly, all of you will do. Like, I, I think we want to coalesce a lot of different ideas into some key themes and make some decisions about what you all feel like are the priorities of this group. Let me try with a couple of categories that I feel like I've heard that I feel like are very much related but distinct. And you tell me if I'm getting this right or wrong. One is about the water itself and sort of allowing there to be space for that water to do sort of what it needs to do while sort of minimizing damage. So like that, um, and, and, and I'm trying to categorize that as one thing versus something that is related but distinct, which is that we essentially relocate and elevate things out of um, harm's way. Those feel very similar and in a way very related but also distinct. One is about sort of to some degree Wrightsville and the river channel and what we do and one is about like how we use our, our physical space, particularly our physical space that is exposed to flooding. Do those feel like two sort of distinct, I know there's a lot of overlap between them but do those feel like two distinct Areas of action. Yes. I'm seeing mostly nodding like heads. To me. What's that? The dam seems like a third so to me. The dam actually feels distinct okay. from those other two. Yep. So I'm okay. Gonna, good. I'm, I'm this is good. I think, All right. I think you'll tell me otherwise, right? Uh, so relocate, dry proofing, wet proofing. I heard uh, Paul Bovers and another architect from town. They had an excellent VPR. But it, I think that's the second one. Relocate, maybe upgradient, dry proofing. Right, wet proofing, we raise everything to the first floor, not use everything in our basement. Definitely a distinct idea, so I got that captured. And then there's a heavy emphasis on soft infrastructure, which I put into widening the corridor, um, you know, river management, totally different, maybe the ultimate piece of infrastructure. That's a constant theme I'm, I'm getting from the group, especially the right half of this Can group. you add that we make the river a, a nice place to be? That recreational place? asset, yes. which that piece, I, yep. Which, yep. Although, can I just say, I think we just merged two different ways of thinking about soft infrastructure, which is, I think you're describing sort of the ecosystem and the waterway, whereas I'm hearing you use the term soft infra infrastructure you, to talk about gov governance. Green and gray. You can say green is So green. green is actually maybe what you green mentioned by that second yeah. category. And then, yeah. and then I would say another sort of theme we've heard here is this one around soft infrastructure, or we could say governance more simply. Like, do we have the government that can get these things done for us uh, and, and can lead us through uh, to these uh, new opportunities? So that's, I think, a third is we would say governance there. I would agree. And can I also um, bat for you? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I really think our number one priority needs to be the wastewater recovery yeah. facility. That was going to be I the mean, one. it needs to be number yeah. one. <laughs> um, and it's not because of anything other than the, the amount of, in, we have invested in this facility and how close it came to catastrophic Consequence. Not only the federal government's invested over at 35. I know, last and we want them to invest that. more. Which, by the way, has a net zero. There was but we're actually making it more sustainable. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. I was just saying, it's huge. Yeah. Wait, yeah. but it's okay for us to have some big ideas and some re relatively narrow ideas that we're prioritizing here. So, well, is, is uh, separating the, the wastewater from the overflow? Does, can that fall in that? 
same yes. category? Because we're protecting the plant from all this water. Yes, I would around. definitely say it is. Okay. So we would say the CSO goes into... Yes. Yeah, but that, but, but that really is something that they've been trying to deal with, we've been trying to deal with for decades. And we're de we, we are dealing with it as much as the citizens of this city are, are willing to pay for it. I mean, we're all paying a huge ticket for this. Mm -hmm. So we all have to recognize that there's bills to be paid for separating stormwater from, from uh, our sewage system. It and maybe it's priority for how you spend your money. I, I agree. I couldn't agree more. I would, I would prioritize it. But that's been a, a discussion that's been going on in the city for 30, 40 years. I mean, I will say it seems to me there's two distinct things here. Totally. One is protecting the wastewater plant and the CSO, the separation of stormwater. And so, but I'll look to you all, because if you merge them to some degree, they get a little bit less impactful. Yep. Whereas if you call them out as individual ones, so like, do you all, show of hands, who thinks those should be one topic? Raise your hand. Who thinks that you want to consider them as two distinct things? Okay, so that's pretty clear that we would, we would list the CSO, uh, uh, separation. I'm not sure if I'm even saying that. CSO is already out. It's ongoing, right? Right. It is ongoing, but you all could decide here that it's really important that we do it quicker. Uh, you could say that tonight. You could say that belongs at the top of our list, this, this separation. Go. Can I suggest, it will seem illogical, but combining the wastewater treatment center and the potential for separation of potentially the district heat plant together in that they are both uh, huge investments that have been made, existing functional resources uh, that we rely on extremely heavily in the case of the wastewater treatment center uh, and uh, maybe less than we could in the case of the district heat plant, but they are there, they function, and they cost a lot of money. Um, so can we look at these as existing resources that we both need to examine, protect, utilize, care for? I mean, I think the answer is you can. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Strategically, my advice to you all is that, again, you lose some impact if you lump those things. So like district heating is a standalone thing, and I, and I think we should sort of entertain that as it, it's up to you. Uh, but it should go on the list for you all. The district heat sort of infrastructure is owned by the state. It's not only that, but it, it worked. It, it, it is not vulnerable. The waste treatment plant was vulnerable. The history of these location is well, not vulnerable. Um, well, okay. Let's not. Uh, yeah. All right, we got to. We actually. What am I missing can for our Go ahead. We're missing. Can we look at the, the plans that all those people who are very talented did for the town. So let's just say Revisit. bring back net zero Montpelier plan. Yeah. That, that's its own. And I would say it's different from governance a little bit. Like I, I heard that pretty, at least my ears were hearing, revisiting good planning that's already happened. Right. And that looks like it's got a couple of forms here. Along with the net zero. But, yeah. I mean, there's like... So that sort of a category is not just net zero, but other good plans right. that have happened for Montpelier. I think there's also a different kind of resiliency as well for the architecture downtown, the resilience and reutilizing the utilities that are connected and how do we change that that's an immediate thing right now as the buildings are being restructured how do we fix that I mean it goes into the you know uh, yellow mustard flooded but they hosed it out because it has a concrete slab they filled their basement already or they didn't have one um, getting rid of those stone foundations, bringing utilities up. I think that's part of downtown resiliency, and that's but, not on the list. Well, I think it, it is yeah. in that we, we kind of lumped it into the relocate, which we also I, included I think it's a dry stone. proofing and wet proofing. <laughs> so maybe we're guilty of lumping. And I, you I, would think, say I think it's be. a totally separate thing, because I think that has to do with city planning and zoning and approvals as things get built, not the city being, not not the actual function of doing it. Okay. So I would say that's part Do of the Do folks government. agree that that should be its own distinct 
uh, idea that you all consider. We actually have to get to voting on this. Like, uh, What's the idea? Uh, the idea is essentially through code to require people to rebuild in a more uh, robust way so that the water doesn't inflict the same. Yeah, we actually do. You, you okay. can't build new without raising up. And you can't do substantial improvements without. So that, that's all. There's not a movement towards it. And I think back to you know, net zero, the longer strategic vision is still a unique thing. That could be district keeper going, so where are we going in 50 years? Was what that was about. Right? You know, snap your fingers and, and change downtown in a, in a decade. But longer term, what governments do we need to have that bigger vision, to have a resilient downtown that looks like one of those huge ideas? Does uh, code, just for clarification, does code uh, hit rebuild? New build, yes. Does it hit rebuild, though? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Totally. Okay. Um, I forget the name of it. The, uh, Hazard. South River. Hazard. What, what is the What is the oh, city, right? Sure. All right. We're, the train is getting ready to leave the station. So here's what we have to do very quickly. I'm going to try to read through what I heard as the ideas. And you all get to raise your hands only twice. We only are we are we going back upstairs with how many priorities? Well, uh, I'd say we're going to see based on how well things coalesce. I would say anywhere from two to four priorities. Really? So we can't yeah. have yeah. all of them. No, you six. can't have all of them. No. Sorry, that's the that's the hard thing. So you can raise your hands twice. Read through the list first. So we don't I'm going to read through the list real quick. Was, was flood storage infrastructure within? Or was that? You can, wait can, we, can we combine them all now? No, I shouldn't <laughs> use it. We can't combine them all. Let me just try uh, to read these. Under a space. Okay. Uh, uh, here's uh, uh, relocate is idea one, which is essentially moving things, buildings in particular, outside of uh, the floodway. Uh, Re yeah. okay. Rebuilding to me or, re or relocating can be up as well as out. I'm sorry, up or out. I mean both of those. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Yes. Uh, green infrastructure was another one, which is much more about focusing on the water and helping uh, the water move such that it does, uh, does less damage. Uh, governance is a third. I think we've sort of talked about that. Yeah. Uh, wastewater plant protection yeah. yes. is its own. The dam, I think, is what I heard from you is that should be its own thing. Uh, and that's both operations and a little bit of investment as well. But it's also the watershed above, right? There's ideas about trying to slow the water into the dam. Yeah. Sure. So dam, yeah. so dam and watershed, we could say. Yep. Yeah. Uh, CSO separation. Uh, district heating, and net zero uh, Montpelier and other sort of visions for the future. Yes, what's that? What if I, we really got to make a decision here. So, Why are we limiting now? Isn't that the next step for the next group to limit? Well, to really come up with? our job tonight is to come with three or four things. All of these things will go before a steering committee, but like I think we are stronger if we narrow this list. If we can't, then I'll go upstairs and read them all. If you guys say I'm not, we should not narrow. I don't think we should not narrow. But don't be like everybody votes. All right. Because if you did them without governance, okay. So wait, wait. We're just going to do a show of hands because it'll help us all know how we feel. Okay. I just see one last hand for. Well, so I just, I guess I'm just concerned, you know, with the part of this is that I think there's a thread here that's kind of missing, which is. And maybe the net zero terminology just really throws me off because that means a lot of different things. I think we're talking about re-envisioning Montpelier today. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and green infrastructure is like a tactic for re-envisioning Montpelier downtown, and, and so are some of these other components. But I'm not quite hearing in there something that is about <coughs> actually kind of getting at. I think what the vision. Was. I, I really want to like the vision piece. I think is missing to me somewhere there. Well, so if we change that net zero Montpelier, which was a vision, yeah. to a more general re-envisioning sort of Montpelier's downtown, yeah. does that, uh, is that a, f yeah, yeah we've got to get upstairs, guys. Well, so, it was a lot of visions. Yeah, there were like 15, but we there when that happened. And, and some of them have yeah. Right. What I would say, some of them have All right. I'm not referring to the individual, right? 
right. Let's just go through this exercise of, of show of hands for these. I'm going to change that one to re-envisioning Montpelier's downtown as a small uh, uh, gesture. Uh, you get two. All right. So on the system. Wait, wait, you said uh, <laughs> we're going, Paul. We're going. Yeah. We're going. The door has been open. All right. Wait, wait. Uh, you did say if we don't agree on what's going on. Just all of them. You, right. So let's go through this exercise, and the final decision can be, John, your job is just to read them all and yeah. not narrow. And that's, that's, a, that's a final decision. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> First, uh, the first one is this concept of relocating either up or out, moving our buildings out. Show of hands for that. I'm quick count of three. Thank you. Uh, I got to The green infrastructure, uh, much more about focusing on the water. I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, ten. That's okay. Don't worry about that. Uh, governance. I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Uh, wastewater plant protection. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Jeez, you guys, you're spreading them all. Damn. Plus watershed above. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. CSO separation as like an immediate, like moving ahead on the list. All right, there, we have something off the list anyway. Uh, district heating, two, uh, okay. And re-envisioning Montpelier and the downtown. Let's see. My voted by I know. <laughs> Hang on a second, I said the honest word. All right, so here, I guess here's what I'm hearing, which is we have, uh, well, we have the water infrastructure, governance, wastewater plant protection, the dam and the watershed above, and the re-envisioning downtown as five clear things that got over five votes. Everything else really didn't get to that still, point. They'll still get all seven. Uh, they will all go on the list. Yeah. And it sounds like protecting this, the wastewater plant is low hanging fruit. I mean, it's, no, it's, it's, it's ground. Expensive. Well, it's, it's too, it's however well, many feet they determine so, so are needed to raise the height of that road to increase the dam. Oh. We could repurpose. Oh, hey, fruit is good. 